Welcome to Center Church. My name is Josh Miller. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're new, if you're a guest with us, welcome. We're really glad that you're here. Would love to meet you after the service. Um, a couple months ago, I was talking to a mentor of mine. He's been a pastor of ministry for about 35 years. And he said, you know, Josh, there's a difference between a church that prays and a praying church. I was like, oh, okay, you got me. I'm baited. What's, you know, what's the difference? Uh, tell me more. And he says, well, um, a church that prays has a prayer meeting. A praying, chur- a praying church has a prayer culture. He said, in, in a praying church, here's what's normal. You walk through the lobby and there's, there's two people over here by the side praying for one another, right? You, you walk into here in the service and you see your friend and you know that they had a hard week. And so you just go up to him and say, hey, can I just pray for you? Can I just pray God's, God's encouragement over your life and the truth of the scriptures over your life? Can I pray that we would really experience his presence in this service? When you have a praying culture, prayer is not, not your last resort, it's your first response. You say, man, I need God to move in my life, so I just wanna go to him. When, when you have a praying culture, you're not just seeking God's hand, what he can do for you, but you're seeking God's face. You're seeking who God is. And I, I was sold. I said, man, I wanna be a praying man. I wanna, I wanna lead a praying family. Man, I want our church to be a praying church. But in order for that to happen, our church has to be filled with praying people. And I don't know about you, but I need a lot of help when it comes to prayer. And so that's why next Sunday at five o'clock, we're hosting a night of worship and prayer right here at our facility. And here's what we're gonna do. Man, we're gonna come together and we're gonna worship God. Man, we're gonna seek his face. We're gonna remind ourselves of his attributes and of who he is. We're gonna pursue intimacy with him. And then we're gonna pray and ask him to fulfill his purposes in our lives, to fulfill his purposes in us, man, in our church and in the world. Here, here's just the reality of the Christian life. Everything in the Christian life requires supernatural power. So if you wanna, if you wanna know God more deeply, if you wanna build a strong marriage, man, if you wanna raise godly kids, if you wanna reach your non-Christian friends, prayer is the place to start. And so that's why we're gathering next Sunday for a night of worship and prayer, okay? Justin's gonna give you all the details at the end, but I hope you'll put it on your calendars and I hope you'll plan to join us because I think it's gonna be a really encouraging and powerful evening, okay? Well, let's do this. Let's pray and ask God to teach us to pray. That's a good prayer, right? And then uh, we'll jump into Genesis 28. Lord God, I'm so grateful for the example of the disciples who said, Lord, teach us to pray. Uh, And I just ask that for myself and for us as a church. God, would you teach us to pray? By your spirit, would you show us how to pursue your face, how to seek your face, how to experience intimacy with you like David did, where he said, one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I might dwell in his house all the days of my life and to gaze upon his beauty in his temple. God, we wanna have those hearts and then we want that to overflow into the fulfillment of your purposes. So would you teach us to pray? And would you open our eyes and open our ears as we look at your word in Genesis 28? We pray all these things in Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, meet me in Genesis chapter 28, starting in verse one. Genesis 28, starting in verse one. We're in the third week of a series studying the life of a man named Jacob. And I told you a couple weeks ago that Jacob is one of the most relatable characters in the Bible because his story is so honest. I mean, he was pretty selfish. He just was. He was pretty selfish. He made some really, really bad choices and he burned a lot of bridges. And until this point, his story has been all bad. There's been almost nothing redemptive about the story of Jacob, but that begins to change in Genesis chapter 28. You might say that Genesis 28 is the turning of the spiritual tide in Jacob's life. And here's why. In Genesis 28, for the very first time, Jacob meets with God. Jacob meets with God. Let me ask you, have you ever met with God? Have you ever had an experience with God that changed you? where you, you experience his power and his holiness and his love and his grace towards you in such a way that, that you're not the same. Maybe it was a, at a camp or maybe it was when you were in school or maybe it was when you were in a really, really low moment in your life and you cried out and you said, God heard me and he met me here. Man, I've never been the same. That's what happens in Jacob's life in Genesis 28. And as I've studied this text, here's what I've realized. This text is both profoundly comforting and very challenging. Comforting and challenging. Here's why it's comforting. Because Genesis 28 gives us hope that if God would meet with somebody like Jacob, he might meet with somebody like you. I mean, we're gonna, Jacob's not a good person. He's not. He, he's not like, you know, volunteering at the Ruritan Club and at the SBCA and, you know, a deacon at the church or whatever. Like, he's not a good guy. We would not let him lead a missional community here. Like, we'd be like, sorry, man, you gotta grow some. Before. Like, he's just not. And yet, God meets him there. God meets him when he's on the run because of bad choices that he's made and, and bur- bridges that he's burned but God meets him there. And I think that gives us hope that God might wanna meet you where you are, no matter how many bridges you've burned or no matter how many bad choices you've made. So it's comforting 
It's gonna show us a lot about the character of God, but it's also challenging. Because here's what we find. Jacob is profoundly changed by his encounter with God. And what we learn from this is that you cannot meet with God and remain unchanged. And this is a very pointed thing, and I'm gonna say it at the very beginning, you ready? If you think you've met with God and you've remained unchanged, you have not actually met with God. It's simply impossible to come into personal contact with the God of the universe, the God of the scriptures, the almighty, the alpha and the omega and remain exactly the same, right? When you have met with God, it changes you, not entirely, man, but progressively. And that's what we're gonna see in Jacob's life. So here's the big idea of this text. If you wanted me to summarize it, you ready? God meets us where we are, but doesn't leave us there. God meets us where we are, but doesn't leave us there. So it's gonna, we're gonna be, it's gonna be all comfort and grace and mercy in the first half, and then it's gonna get a little testy in the second half, okay? I'm just telling you right now. All right, so before we jump into chapter 28, let me give you some context so you know what's going on. So in chapter 25, Jacob stole his brother's birthright by manipulating him. In Genesis 27, Jacob stole his brother's blessing by lying to his old blind dad. The result is that Jacob's brother Esau now wants to murder him. Okay, so if you think you have a bad family, you know, be encouraged, it could be worse. I mean, Esau literally is like, I'm gonna kill him as soon as dad dies so that dad doesn't have to go through it. Well, Jacob's mom, Rebecca, hears about this and she's like, oh man, I don't want Jacob to die. Then I only have this son that I don't like as much. So she goes to Isaac and is like, hey, Isaac, will you please send Jacob back to my hometown so that he can meet a nice girl there because I don't want him to marry one of the girls that lives around here. That's literally what she says, okay? And this is Isaac's response, verse one. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Padam Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your, father, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So Isaac says to Jacob, hey, do not take a wife from the Canaanite people who surround us. Instead, I want you to travel, get this, 500 miles on foot to your mom's hometown to find a wife. Why? I mean, 500 miles is a long way, right? I mean, it's a long way today. It was a very long way then. Can you imagine having to like walk or ride an animal for 500 miles to get a date? You're like, I thought Tinder was bad. You know, like could be worse, right? What is going on? Well, well, here's, here's why Isaac is like, you cannot marry someone from around us because the people who surrounded them did not know or love God. They were, they were pagan people, pretty ruthless people, but the people back in Rebecca's hometown did know the, the true God did know Yahweh. So here's the principle for us today. Seek a godly spouse, even if you have to travel 500 miles to get one. <laughs> All right, it's, even if it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and, it, and you're like, there's not a lot of prospects around, it's worth doing it because it's so important. Now here's the reality, you don't have to get married. Okay, I mean, Jesus was single, Paul was single, many men and women throughout church history who, who have made massive impacts for the kingdom of God were single. They lived very fulfilled lives and they leveraged their singleness for the kingdom of God. Being married doesn't make you a first class citizen. Being single doesn't make you a second class citizen in the kingdom of God. Okay, so if, if you wanna remain single, praise God, leverage it for the kingdom. But if you decide to get married, who you marry is really important because your spouse will either help you or hinder you from following Christ. Right, and I don't have time to go through the whole biblical theology of giving you all of the text for why this is, but suffice it to say, if it was important enough for Jacob to travel 500 miles, it's important for us today. All right, here's verse three. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Thus, Isaac sent Jacob away. And he went to Padam Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. In verse four, Isaac mentions the blessing of Abraham. Do you see that? The blessing of Abraham. That refers to the covenant promise which God gave to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. You say, well, how can Isaac give that blessing to Jacob? I thought God made that blessing to Abraham, not to Isaac. Well, you're right, but what happened is Abraham passed the blessing on to Isaac. And now Isaac is passing the blessing along to Jacob. He is handing off the baton of faith to the next generation. You see, as Americans, we tend to think individually, okay? We tend to think like God wants to have a personal relationship with me. And that's true. You, God has no spiritual grandchildren. He only has spiritual children. So every single person might personally repent and believe in Christ to come into the family of God. See John chapter three, go back and listen to that sermon that I preached in the fall. But just because God is seeking a personal relationship with each one of us does not mean that God is only thinking about us individually. If you read the scriptures, you'll find that God thinks personally, but God also thinks generationally. 
Okay, Psalm 78 verse four says this, we will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. Friends, God's will is that each generation would testify about his faithfulness to the next generation. That each generation would take the baton of the gospel and hand it off to those coming behind them. I've told you before, parents, that you cannot make your kids believe the gospel, but you can make the gospel more believable to your kids. You cannot make your kids believe the gospel, but you can make the gospel more believable to your kids based on how you live and, and what you believe and how you orient your life and how you pray and how you seek the face of the Lord. Man, we wanna hand the baton of the gospel off to the next generation, just like someone handed it off to us. Man, that's why we're passionate about ministries like Center Kids and Center Students and Center College, because we wanna take the faith, we wanna hand it to the next generation, it's gonna lead the church and it's gonna be salt and light in the world. Just like Isaac took the promises of God and handed them to Jacob, man, we wanna take the promises of God and we wanna hand them off to those coming behind us, okay? So that's what's going on. Now, in verse six through nine, poor Esau just can't get it right. Esau's like, oh, Jacob's gonna go get a wife, I'll just marry another wife. So he gets a third wife, which is too, too many, just so you know, and, and things don't go well for him. All right, verse 10, we're back to Jacob. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. So Jacob left Beersheba. Now here's the question. Where did Jacob want to be? Beersheba. Okay, Beersheba was home. And remember, man, he, he was a homebody. He liked to dwell indoors. He didn't like camping. He didn't like hiking. He didn't shop at REI, okay? He was indoorsy, not outdoorsy. And now he's on a 500 mile journey by himself. And you know he's never camped before because he uses a rock as a pillow. Okay, like that's a bad day. This is like me camping, right? Like I, some of you that love camping, it's like, well, you love camping because there's 12 inches of foam between you and everything in the outdoors, you know? It's like, you've got all this sweet gear and stuff. And I'm just like, that looks like a good rock, you know, put it on my head. Anyway, so he's having a very, very bad day. Friends, this is, this is not where Jacob expected to be. This is not where Jacob wanted to be. And yet it's where God intended him to be. And sometimes I think our lives can feel that, that way. It's like circumstances can happen in your life, circumstances can happen in your family or in the economy or in culture or whatever else that seem to sort of push you somewhere that you don't wanna be. Like, I don't wanna work here. I don't wanna live here. I don't wanna go to school here. I, I don't wanna be single in my 30s. I don't wanna be divorced. I don't wanna you know, be changing careers at 50. And yet here I am, right? It's not where I wanna be and yet it is where God has you. And the scriptures teach that God is sovereign over all of our lives. That doesn't mean that everything that happens to you is God's will because people do sinful things. But it does mean that God is big enough and powerful enough and good enough to superimpose everything that happens in our lives for his glory and for our good. Sometimes the place you don't wanna be is the very place that God shows up. And that's what happens in Jacob's life, verse 12. And he dreamed and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So Jacob falls asleep on his rock pillow and he has a dream and God speaks to him in this dream. And if you look, if you look through the scriptures, God often speaks to his people through dreams and visions, okay? And the difference between a dream and a vision, you're asleep when you have a dream, you're not asleep when you have a vision, okay? Um, and it's just worth noting that the people in the Old Testament didn't have the Bible, Right? God has given us his revelation, and so it's a lot easier to know who he is. Back then, he would often reveal himself through dreams and visions. So Jacob has this, this dream, and he, he sees this really, uh, man, poignant image. There's a ladder, a giant ladder, that's set up on earth that's reaching all the way up to heaven. And the angels of God are ascending and descending on the ladder. So the, the words used, um, man, emphasize activity. So just they're up and down and up and down and up. They're, they're going down to the earth, they're doing stuff, they're coming back up, they're reporting to God. They're going back, to, I mean, it's just back and forth, back and forth, like a busy freeway. Okay, so, so Jacob looks up and he sees this and it's like, okay, what, what does all this mean? Well, it, it's actually a really helpful illustration about what's called a biblical worldview. Okay, so a worldview simply means how you interpret reality. Okay, uh, anybody, glasses people, anybody wear glasses out there? We got some glasses people, raise your hand, I can see you, okay? All right, great, great. Uh, so when I was a kid, I had glasses. Glasses were not cool when I was a kid, they are very cool now. 
all right? And I had LASIK surgery when I was 18. So if you ever see me wearing glasses up here, it's sheer vanity. That's all it is. You're like, he didn't even have lenses in those, right? Um, but here, what, what happens when you take your glasses off, everything is fuzzy, right? The world's still there, but you're not sure what it is. You put your glasses on, all of a sudden you can see things, you can interpret reality. Well, that's what a worldview is like. It's a set of beliefs and presuppositions that you put on and interpret the world through. And this, this dream is an illustration of what a biblical worldview looks like, of what it looks like to have the Bible on as your glasses. Because here's what the Bible says. God is our creator. Creator, we are his creation. He desires to be involved in our lives. Okay, God is not like us. Creator, creation, there's a distinction there. God has always been, we were created. Okay, God is the creator, of maker of heaven and earth. He dwells like Jacob sees far above in the heavens, far above us, and yet he wants to be intimately involved in our lives. That's why the angels are coming and going and coming and going and coming and going, because that is God's desire to be intimately involved in our lives. Now that's very different than many other worldviews you could choose from. You could choose atheism. Atheism says there is no God, 100% material, 0% spiritual, so there is no God, there are no angels, there's no activity, one way or the other. You can choose pantheism. Pantheism is like Eastern religions. Um, you, you see it a lot if like you do yoga, uh, something like that. The idea of pantheism is that God is creator and we are creation, but we're one and the same. It's smashed together. So like the divine spark is in everything. So, you know, like you seek the divine spark in that rock formation and that grove of pine trees and, and those kind of things. And so like, you know, yoga at the end when they're like, you know, the, the divine light in me bows to the divine light in you, that's pantheism. So that's like Eastern religions. So in pantheism, there's God, creator and created, but they're one and the same. There's no distinction. God's not up in heaven. He's in all of us. He's in everything, All right, So that's pantheism. A third option uh, would be deism. So deism is what like Thomas Jefferson believed. Okay, and deism says God is like a divine clockmaker who created the world, set it running, and then stepped away. He's like an absentee landlord, okay? He's not interested in your life. He's not interested in what's going on. You can't expect him to show up, right? So the Bible comes along and says, no, God is different than us. He is holy, he is set apart, but he wants to be involved in your life. He wants to be involved in all the details of our lives. The angels are coming and going and coming and going. Man, and that is an incredible truth that we can hold on to. So this, this dream kind of helps us understand, all right, this is how God interacts with us. Let's keep reading and see what else it shows us. Verse 13, and behold, the Lord God stood above the ladder and said, I'm the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Jacob saw the Lord high and exalted above him, and then he heard the Lord speak. And this is what God said. He said, Jacob, just like I cared for your grandfather Abraham, just like I cared for your father Isaac, I'm gonna care for you. I'm gonna care for you. I'm gonna give you the land that you're laying on. I'm gonna multiply your descendants, and through your offspring, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Guys, this is the very last thing that Jacob expected. Let's remember context. Why is Jacob here? Because he's a slime bag. Right? It's like he's basically in a cheap hotel in the middle of nowhere because he's on the run. I mean, he, he stole from his brother. He lied to his blind dad. He burned all of his bridges. He's on the run. He is not on a prayer retreat. He's not. He's not meditating. He's not reading the Bible. Right? He's about as low as you can be, and that is where he meets with God. How is that possible? That's possible because God is the one who initiated towards Jacob. Jacob did not initiate towards God. And you've gotta understand this concept if you're gonna understand the Bible. That is always how it works in the Bible. Think with me. When Adam took of the fruit in the Garden of Eden and then he hid himself with fig trees, did Adam go after God or did God go after Adam? God went after Adam. When Abraham was living in pagan Haran, worshiping moon gods, did Abraham go after God or did God go after Abraham? God went after Abraham. When Moses murdered a guy in Egypt and then ran off into the wilderness and was there for 40 years tending sheep, was Moses seeking after God or did God seek after Moses? God sought after Moses. When David was in the sheep pens, the youngest of Jesse's sons, man, was he just crying out for God and God heard him or did God seek after David? God sought after David. When the disciples were just fishing on the Sea of Galilee, making a living, did they drop their nets and say, we sense that the Messiah is here? No, Jacob, or Jesus pointed at him and said, come with me and I will make you fishers of men. When Paul was on the road to Damascus, was he headed to a retreat? No, he was heading to kill Christians. And that is where Jesus confronted him and said, you are going to be my apostle to take the gospel to the very people that you're trying to terrorize. From beginning to end, God initiates towards us. We don't initiate towards him. Friends, I hate to tell you, you are not seeking after God. Or if you think you are, you're never gonna find him but the good news of the gospel is that God is seeking after you. 
Luke 15 says that we are like lost sheep out in the wilderness with no chance of finding home. And what God does is at great cost to himself, he goes out into the wilderness, he finds us, he puts us on his shoulders and he carries us home. Jacob does not meet with God because Jacob had finally done enough good things to make his way to heaven. Jacob met with God because God is gracious and merciful and God decided to initiate towards Jacob. And here's what we learned from this. This is so important, write this down. We don't go up to God, God comes down to us. We don't go up to God, God comes down to us. Did Jacob go up to God? Did he build a massive ladder up to heaven? No, God in grace and mercy came down to him. And this is the difference between Christianity and every other religion. Every other religion says, you've gotta build the ladder up to God through your good works. And they have different rules, but it's the same concept. Islam has the five pillars. Buddhism has the eightfold path. Mormonism has the Book of Mormon. But it's the same concept. Be a good person, do the right things, climb the ladder, get to heaven. The Bible says, God is way too holy and you are way too weak and sinful to ever get up to him. Like you're never gonna make it up the ladder. And so in grace and kindness, God came down to his people. He did it for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as we're seeing here. He does it for the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. He does it for Solomon in the temple and he did it fully and finally in Jesus Christ. When God the Son took on flesh and came to the world so that we could have a relationship through repentance and faith. Man, we don't go up to God, God comes down to us. And Genesis 28 is actually the opposite of an event that happens in Genesis 11. So back in Genesis 11, there's this place called Babel. And a group of people get together and they say, here's what we should do. Let's make a name for ourselves by building a tower up to God in heaven. We're gonna build a tower, we're gonna go up to God in heaven and and God judged them and God confused their languages. So Genesis 11 is about man going up to God. Genesis 28 is about God coming down to man. You see, religion is about Babel, but the gospel is about Bethel. Religion is about Babel, but the gospel is about Bethel. So here's my question. Practically, are you living in Babel or are you living in Bethel? Now I know what you would say. I'm living in Bethel, Josh. That's the right answer, right? You've just been preaching about it for 21 minutes and 24, 25, 26 seconds. But practically, at the everyday level, are you living like you have to earn it or are you living like your salvation and your standing and your identity is received from Jesus Christ? Let me give you some evaluative questions, okay? If you're living in Babel, you know what will often happen? You'll feel exhausted. You'll feel guilt-driven. You'll feel like, man, the church is always asking from me. The church is always demanding from me. Man, God is like a harsh taskmaster. It's like one long list of do's and don'ts. If you're living in Babel, you can't be honest about your struggles with other people. You'll have a thick wall up because you can't admit that you're not doing as well as they are, because then what does that mean about you? You also can't celebrate the success of other people because the success of others makes you feel inferior. It makes you feel like they're higher on the ladder than you are. And so even when someone else is successful, you know, you know what you do, you do what I do. It's like, oh, well, that's great, but. Well, yeah, he makes more money than me, but I have a better marriage, right? You're like, oh yeah, yeah, their, their kids are like way better at sports, but I bet they don't know Jesus. Right, we just come up with these ways to say like, oh, your success is not as good as my success, right? Because we're living in Babel. We feel like we have to earn it. It's all about outperforming people, comparing, compat- contrasting, conquering, competing. What if you live in Bethel? What's it like when you live in Bethel? Oh, Bethel's so much better. When you live in Bethel, you're just humble and grateful. You didn't earn it. You didn't climb any ladder. The ladder came down to you. And so you're not threatened by the success of other people. You, you don't have to outperform anyone else. You can be honest about your struggles. You can be honest about your sin. You can be honest about your marriage. You can be honest. That I got no idea what I'm doing in parenting, but my kids have pants on, so it's a good day, you know? It's like you can be honest because you're not proving your identity through performance. Man, if you live in Bethel, it sets you free from perfectionism. If you live in Bethel, you think of God as your heavenly father, not some divine taskmaster. Man, when you live in Bethel, you know that you're saved by grace through faith and not by performance. And it just makes you a very winsome, compelling person. Friends, God wants his people to live in Bethel, not to live in Babel. Verse 15, behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So along with the promise of the land and the lineage, God also gives Jacob the promise of his presence. He says, hey, I'm not gonna leave you or forsake you until I accomplish everything that I have promised you. In Matthew 28, Jesus makes that same promise to his people today. He says, behold, I will be with you always until the end of the age. If you are in Christ, then the Holy Spirit dwells within you no matter what circumstances you are walking through. And friends, that's really, really good news. 
Because, because that means God is with you, the presence of God is with you through every transition of young adult life. That means God is with you when you send your kids off to college and you're not sure what's gonna happen. That means God is with you when you lose your job or you lose a loved one or you hear the doctor say something that you never thought the doctor would say to you. And if you are in Christ and the Holy Spirit dwells within you and no matter what happens, you have a firm foundation as we sang about and because God's presence is with you. Just as God promised to be with Jacob, God has promised to be with his people today. So you could summarize verse one through 15 by saying God meets us where we are. God meets us where we are. Jacob hadn't cleaned up his life. Jacob wasn't a good person and Jacob wasn't seeking after God. But God was seeking after Jacob. And through the work of Jesus Christ, God is seeking after you. You're not here on accident. You're not here on accident. You're not just here because you, you know, somebody happened to invite you and you happened to come. You're here because God Almighty is seeking after you. He's drawing you to himself. He's saying, I want to have a relationship with you no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how long it's been, through repentance and faith, you can have a relationship with God because he is gracious. You don't have to live in Babel. You can move to Bethel. That's Jacob's story. Now, starting in verse 16 is the hinge of the story. And it goes from very comforting to very challenging. Because in verses 16 through 22, we see the impact that meeting with God had on Jacob's life and the impact that meeting with God should have on our lives. Verse 16, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid, underline that. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. So when Jacob awoke, he was afraid and he was filled with awe. Awe means um, a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear or wonder. And it's really how you should feel anytime you catch a glimpse of God. Anytime you experience God's presence, anytime, man, you meet with him, you should be filled with awe and fear. Because when you have a biblical understanding of God, you realize that he is not like you. That as high as the heavens are above the earth, so much higher are his thoughts than yours. Man, that he sits enthroned above the heavens and above the earth, that he is served by innumerable angels and that it is a terrifying prospect to fall into the hands of a living God. So when you've really met with God, you walk away with, with a, a holy fear and awe. You, you don't think of him as like your fun uncle. You don't think of him as a divine butler. You don't think of him as a coach to be consulted, but as a king to be obeyed. So if you wanna know like Josh, I don't know if I've met with God, how do I tell? My question might be, man, how much... How much do you fear God? Do you fear breaking his commandments? How big is he in, his, in your life? How big is he in your budget? How big is he is in your calendar? How big is he in your career? How big is he in your bedroom? Man, how big is God in your life? If he's really, really big, if he's really, really weighty, then you probably have a, a biblical fear of God. But if he's really, really small, then you probably don't. Um, I struggle with people pleasing. Anybody, you don't have to raise your hands. Anybody else struggle with people pleasing? Right, okay, well, me and Helen will just talk then. All the rest of you struggle with lying. That's what you struggle with. Um, I'm convinced all of you struggle with people pleasing to some degree or another. And, you know, we call it different things. Like when we're young, we call it peer pressure, right? Um, when we get older, we call it people pleasing. Um, if you're really technical, you might call it codependency or you might just say, I just care about my reputation or whatever else. Um, but here's what people pleasing is. People pleasing is when what other people say or don't say, do or don't do, controls how I feel. Whether I'm happy or not happy, secure or insecure, is controlled by other people. You know what I'm talking about? So it's like, oh, what does my boss think about, you know, that thing that I just submitted? Or, or what does she think about, you know, me? And why didn't he end that text message with an exclamation point? Like, like what's going on, right? It's when how we feel is dictated by other people. And I've, yeah, I've struggled with it for a very long time. And so like, you know, I've like read, like, what does the world say, you know, we should do about this? So there's a couple answers. If you go there and kind of go to Barnes and Noble, here's what you'll get. Uh, number one is... Uh, like, just don't care. Just don't care what people think. And it's like, well, if I could do that, I would have done it a long time ago, you know? Like, that's not very helpful. Uh, and you also might turn into a sociopath, so don't do that. Um, so I don't care what people think. Uh, number, the second kind of layer is, hey, don't care what people think and, and love yourself. Like, love yourself. Just like, build up your self-esteem, remind yourself that your puppy's breath and you're a snowflake and, you know, your rainbow sparkles and all these things. Like, you're, you know, there's nobody like you. Um, and that, I know that might be helpful. I'm sure there's people out there that, that really do struggle with like self-worth and like need to be encouraged in that. Um, but my problem was that as I looked at myself, I was like, I'm really not that great. 
You know, it's like the problem is I don't have a whole lot of resources to build my self-esteem with, you know? It's like, I know my thoughts and I know my motives and I know my failures, right? Better than anybody else. And so it was like, this, this really wasn't working. Um, and, and if you, if, just so you know, like if you go into like the secular counseling world, they don't have a solution for this. This is a pandemic that is crushing people. They don't have a solution for it. Um, here's the Bible solution. And this has really been helpful for me. The Bible says, look, the, the reason that you fear man is because you don't fear God enough. And so the solution is not like look within and build myself up and tell me how good I am or not worry about other people. The solution is get a big biblical view of who God is. Like see him in all of his power, see him in all of his eternality, see him in his perfect attributes, see him in his, his perfect way, see him in his divine wisdom and counsel and wrath and grace and mercy, see the sweeping nature of his redemptive plan throughout thousands of years of human history, have a gigantic view of God, and then you just won't be controlled by other people. You see, the problem is that most of us walk around with a very big view of people and a very small view of God. And what we need to do is flip that and have a very big view of God and that will help us have a smaller view of people. And here's the good news. When you don't need people, it frees you to love people. Because here's the thing, if I need you for my own self-worth, I can't actually love you. Do you know why? Because everything I'm doing for you is actually for me. You see this? Oh, I'm somebody's business right now. It's like, okay, it's like, okay, like I want my friend, I'm gonna serve my friend and I'm gonna go, you know, pick her, pick her up lunch or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But if you need your friend to think well of you, to feel good about yourself, underneath all of that is actually you wanting something for yourself. I want this friend to think of me as a caring person. Gosh, and I'm a pastor and this is sick, okay? Sometimes this happens to me when I'm like, somebody's telling me something's hard and in my mind, I'm like, all right, Josh, be sympathetic, use the right words, pray for them so they'll think you're a good pastor. How selfish is that? But see, when I don't need people to think I'm a good pastor, when you don't need your friend to think that you're caring to boister your self-worth because you're like, I'm, who I am is defined by this huge, massive, glorious God and you don't need people, it actually sets you free to love people. So when you encounter God, if you've encountered God, it will increasingly create a holy reverential fear in your heart towards him, man, just like it did in Jacob's life. All right, look at verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. Oh, I'm sorry, I just read that. Um, verse uh, 18. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. You see that word so right there in verse 18? So, that's a word of causation. That means as a result of meeting with God, Jacob did something, right? So this is the picture of when you really meet with God, it creates action in your life. It creates change in your life. So what did he do? Well, what he did was kind of strange. He takes the rock that he used as a pillow, he sets it up as a monument, and then he pours oil on top of it. You know, go home and be blessed. Go do that, right? He's like, what the heck is going on? Um, well, so here's what's going on. In the Old Testament, the way that you consecrated something was you anointed it with oil. To consecrate something means you set it apart for holy purposes, okay? So for example, uh, the priests were consecrated with oil before they served in the temple, David was consecrated with oil. He was anointed with oil before he served as king. Jesus was anointed with oil before he went to the cross. All right, so that's kind of what's going on here. In the Old Testament, track with me, the emphasis is on consecrated places wherein the presence of God dwells. Okay, Bethel, Mount Sinai, Ark of the Covenant, the temple. In the New Testament, the emphasis shifts to consecrated people in whom the presence of God dwells. So 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? That means if you're in Christ, your body, mind, and heart have become holy places because the spirit of God, the spirit of holiness dwells within you. So here's the question. Have you consecrated yourself? Metaphorically speaking, have you anointed yourself with oil and set yourself apart to God's purposes? Uh, you know, back during the Crusades, uh, before leaving for the Holy Land, Crusaders would get baptized. And they believed that it guaranteed them success in battle and salvation in death. But when they would get baptized, they would hold their sword above the water. And they would say, I want everything about my life to be consecrated except my weapon. I wanna go use my weapon, and I'm gonna do some things that God isn't going to approve of, so I'd like to, I'd like to have all, everything but my weapon consecrated. And we look at that and we, and we rightly think like what a gross misrepresentation and misunderstanding of Christianity. And yet how many of us do the same thing? It's not a sword, 
It's my bank account. I'd like to have everything but my bank account consecrated. It's, it's not a sword, it's my sexuality. I'd like to have everything but my sexuality consecrated. It's not my sword, it's my career. I'd, I'd like to have everything but my career consecrated. It's my marriage, it's parenting, it's my schedule, it's my free time. We do the exact same thing. But what we see in Jacob is like, when you actually meet God, you're not holding anything out of the water. You, you realize what a ridiculous notion it is to say like, hey, God of the universe, I'd like to serve you with 40% of me or 80% of me. I'd like to hold this out of the water and let everything else be for you. Now, when, when you meet with God and when his spirit comes to dwell within you and you become a holy place, man, he calls for us to consecrate all of ourselves unto him and to set ourselves apart as holy. All right, verse 20, last thing. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I've set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full 10th to you. So after setting this place apart as holy unto the Lord, Jacob makes a vow. And it's actually debated whether this is like a good vow or a bad vow. Because you read it one way and you're like, it sounds like he's sort of bargaining with God, doesn't it? Like, well, if you do this, I'll do that. So like, it might be a bad vow. It might be a good vow. Some people think he's just expressing faith. Like, I know you're gonna do this, so I'm gonna do that. I don't know which one it is, okay? But here's, here's what we see. Here's what is clear about this interaction. After Jacob experienced God's presence, he felt compelled to serve him. God didn't command him to serve him. He just wanted to serve him. He wanted to make a vow. He said, man, you're gonna be my God. I'm gonna build you a house and I'm gonna give a 10th of all that I receive back to you in worship. And I would say when you experience the glory and the goodness and the grace of God, it should compel you to wanna to serve him, to serve him with your time, with your talent and with your treasure, just like Jacob did. It's gonna take time and talent to build the temple and it's gonna take a lot of treasure. And he talks about that. See, what, what we know is that when we truly admire someone and think highly of them, we don't mind serving them. So it's a well-known story that the men and women who served Winston Churchill in World War II considered it the greatest honor of their life. It was like while, while Sir Winston was stemming the onslaught of Nazism, and galvanizing parliament to fight and saving the Western world, I was making his lunch. And I was, I was doing his laundry and I was waiting in the car. And it's the greatest honor of my life. I got to serve a truly great man who did truly great things and it was an honor. And that is what our heart should be, man, when we truly encounter God. He's glorious and he's good and he's a powerful, everlasting, kind, perfect king. And so our heart should just be like, I wanna serve you. I, I want to, how can I serve you, Lord? I would love to host a missional community. I would love to give of my time and my talent and my treasure. I'd love to join a serving team. I'd love to invest in the next generation through kids ministry. I, what can I do? Here I am, send me. Here I am to serve. Man, when Jacob met God, it compelled him to serve. And when we meet with God, it should compel us to do the same. All right, so here's a summary of the text so far. Verses one through 15, man, God meets us where we are. Verses 16 through 22, God doesn't leave us there. Meeting with God in a biblical sense is such a powerful experience that it inevitably leads to change in our lives. Jacob met with God and it changed his life. So here's the question. Can you meet with God? Is there a ladder between heaven and earth in your life? Will the gate of heaven open to you? Or is that just for Jacob? Because he was kind of a special person in the scriptures of the covenant family. Like, does that apply to you? And before we answer too quickly, let's, let's remember some things. We're talking about, man, almighty God, who sees your motives, who sees your thoughts, who sees all of your actions, who will not dwell with even a trace of sin, who the book of Hebrews says dwells in inapproachable light. It says it is a terrifying notion to fall into the hands of the living God. This is the God who knows what you did last night. This is the God who knows your browsing history. This is the God that knows those selfish motives way down deep that you hope nobody ever finds out about. This is the God in front of whom we are exposed entirely. Can we meet with God? Is there a ladder between heaven and earth for us? Is the gate of heaven open to us? We find the answer in John chapter one. So in John one, Jesus is talking to Nathanael. And after telling Nathanael that he had seen him under the fig tree, Jesus says this, you will see greater things than these. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened, the gate of heaven swung open, and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Here's what Jesus is saying. The ladder isn't a thing 
It's a person. It's me. I am Jacob's ladder. I am the living link between heaven and earth. I'm the one mediator between God and man, and I am the gate of heaven. Friends, we could not go up to God. So at great cost to himself, Jesus Christ came down to us. He lived the perfect life that Jacob didn't live. He lived the perfect life that you didn't live. He lived the perfect life that I haven't lived. And then he went to the cross. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us that on the cross, Jesus became Jacob's sin. He became my sin and he became your sin. The cross didn't have Jesus' name on it. It had ours. And through his death, Jesus absorbed all of the wrath of God against people like Jacob and against people like me and against people like you. And in his resurrection, Jesus conquered death. And he has established one way, one ladder between heaven and earth. It's him. It's through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You see, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, and no matter how long it's been, you can have a personal relationship with God because Jesus Christ built a ladder for you with the wood of the cross. He suffered for your sin so that you could receive his righteousness. And when you encounter that kind of grace and that kind of mercy, it changes you. And like Jacob, you said, here I am, Lord. Send me. I wanna be your servant. So if you bow your heads with me, I wanna speak, I wanna speak the truth of the scriptures over you. Because I think that so many of us in our heads believe we live at Bethel, but in our hearts and in our hands, we live at Babel. We live like we have to earn it. So receive this as the promise of God from the scriptures to you. The Lord is merciful and gracious to you. He is slow to anger with you. He is abounding in steadfast love towards you. He will not always chide you, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with you according to your sins, nor repay you according to your iniquities. For friends, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love towards you. As far as the east is from the west, an infinite distance, so far has God removed your sins from you. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows your frame and he remembers that you are dust. Friend, you are not your sexual sin. You are not the worst things that you've done. You are not the worst things that have been done to you. If you are in Christ, then God has taken off your filthy robes and he has taken the perfect spotless robes of Jesus Christ and he has draped them around your shoulders and he's embraced you in his arms and said, you are my son, you are my daughter. I will never leave you nor forsake you because in Christ you are mine. Father God, I thank you that you are a gracious God. I thank you that you don't treat me, you don't treat us according to our sins, but you are merciful and kind to us. But I thank you that you met me in my lowest moment. I thank you that you will meet anyone here in their lowest moment. And just as you changed Jacob by mercy and by grace and by your power, that you can change us. So Father, I pray for faith. I pray for faith in my heart and for the people's hearts in this room that we would believe that we can be changed by your power and that we can live in Bethel and we don't have to labor in Babel and that you would get all the glory and honor and praise. But we love you. Pray all these things in Jesus' name.